Hi everyone, this video is part four of the 2A series on perception and thought processes from unit two on cognition for AP psychology students. This particular lesson focuses on how we've come to define and assess intelligence. So now let's take a look at where we are in the unit. As you can see, our arrow is down at the bottom of the unit content list. And so far in this series, you should have watched parts one through three, which covered the topics in the CED related to perception and thinking and problem solving. Now we are beginning the topic of intelligence, and this is gonna take up two videos. Today's video will cover theories of intelligence and the history of intelligence testing. Whereas the video to come will focus specifically on psychometrics. Throughout today's video, I will cover a few major themes related to the theories of intelligence and the history of intelligence testing. They will fall along the questions listed on this screen. All of these concepts will be explained in today's video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So what is intelligence? The answer is complex, and maybe it depends on your context and how you define it. Intelligence is one of the most debated topics in psychology. Questions arise like, what is intelligence? Are we born with it? Can we develop it? How do we measure intelligence and what aspects are measurable? Students often think of intelligence as being school smart, but that just depends on your context. For example, in a hunter-gatherer society, being smart or being intelligent may involve knowing the medicinal properties of plants. While being a high school student in North America, smart or intelligent might look like students being able to solve complex math problems, like the students on the right who developed proofs for the Pythagorean theorem using trigonometry, which was believed to be impossible for 2000 years. These are examples of intelligence. Now, intelligence is important that we are not using cultural standards as our definition. So whether the individuals are in Western societies or indigenous cultures, we can see that something bigger is underlying their abilities. So in essence, intelligence is the ability to learn from experience, to solve problems, and to adapt to new situations. So the key points to remember here is that intelligence is complex. It's influenced by genetics, environment, and culture, and it takes on many different forms depending on the context. But at its core, it involves learning from experience, solving problems and adapting to new situations. British psychologist Charles Spearman introduced the concept of general intelligence or G. He believed that a single innate intelligence underlies all mental abilities and that general intelligence influences our capacity to learn and solve problems in other areas. Using a factor analysis, Spearman found that people who score well in one area tended to score well in other areas, suggesting a common general intelligence. He identified specific abilities like mechanical, verbal, spatial, and numerical, but he added those together through a statistical measure to compute a central, general, or overall intelligence score. Spearman's theory of general intelligence remains debated, but it's similar to how tests like the ACT provide an overall score based on different subtests. The key idea is that G is the underlying ability that predicts our performance in various tasks. Building on the idea of general intelligence, Raymond Cattell and John Horn expanded this idea of this singular underlying intelligence by proposing that it actually consisted of two elements, fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence, they said, referred to our ability to reason quickly and think abstractly, like solving new puzzles or overcoming unfamiliar challenges. Crystallized intelligence, they said, represented our accumulated knowledge, including our vocabulary and learned skills. Longitudinal studies have showed that crystallized intelligence actually improves with age, while fluid intelligence peaks in early adulthood and then begins to decline as we age. Both of these factors play a key role in our mental abilities. I did want to point out that these terms are actually mentioned in Unit 3 of the CED, but I felt that they were worth mentioning here alongside of the theories of intelligence. Since the mid-1980s, psychologists have expanded the definition of intelligence beyond just academic abilities. Howard Gardner and Robert Sternberg are key figures in this shift. In 1983, Howard Gardner introduced the theory of multiple intelligences, proposing eight 
distinct types of intelligence. Musical, interpersonal, and logical mathematical were just a few. You can actually see them represented in the diagram on the left side. His theory suggests that people can excel in one area without being strong in others. Cases like savant syndrome or brain damage were used to support this idea that someone can have abilities in one area while lacking abilities in other areas. Sternberg simplified intelligence into three independent components. He believed that there were three intelligences, analytical, creative, and practical. Both Howard Gardner and Robert Sternberg agree that intelligence is made up of multiple independent factors that can be independent of one another rather than just one central general intelligence. So now that we've discussed some of the theories about what comprises intelligence, let's go over how intelligence has been measured over time. The history of intelligence testing began in 1905 with Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon, who developed a mental age test to identify students in France needing educational support. This test measured children's cognitive abilities relative to their chronological age, which is the actual age of the child in years. Mental age refers to the age level at which the child performs intellectually based on the average abilities of children at that age. Binet and Simon aimed to identify which students were developmentally behind, helping determine their mental age. In the accompanying photograph here on the screen, you can see Alfred Binet assessing the mental age of a child. And this concept of mental age would continue to influence intelligence testing in the years to come. In 1912, William Stern introduced the concept of the intelligence quotient, or IQ, as a way to quantify intelligence. Stern's formula compared mental age, or MA, to chronological age, or CA, to provide a numerical value for intelligence. To calculate IQ, an individual's mental age is determined through a standardized test. Then IQ is calculated by dividing their mental age by their chronological age and multiplying it by 100. For example, a child with a mental age of 8 and a chronological age of 8 would have an IQ of 100, which represents the average intelligence level for an 8-year-old. Another example would be if a child's mental age is 10, and their chronological age is 8, then we would divide 10 by 8 and multiply that by 100, which would be 125. This IQ would indicate that the child has an above average intelligence. From this, you should understand the IQ formula, the elements involved, and how IQ scores compare intelligence among people of similar ages. In 1916, Lewis Terman, an American psychologist, adapted Alfred Binet's work with mental age to create the first standardized IQ test. This was called the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. Terman emphasized standardized scoring and the use of the IQ formula, making intelligence testing widely applicable in both educational and psychological contexts. While the first version was mainly suitable for children, multiple revisions have been made, with the most recent edition, the Stanford Binet 5, being released in 2003. This latest version includes five key cognitive assessments, fluid reasoning, knowledge, quantitative reasoning, visual spatial processing, and working memory, providing a comprehensive measure of an individual's intellectual abilities. The example on the screen is a fluid reasoning question from a fifth to sixth grade IQ test. It asks the student to identify the picture that best completes the pattern. Using the example in the top row, you should determine the picture that best fits with the square on the bottom row. This is an example of how students would need to use fluid reasoning. Though the College Board doesn't reference specific names of IQ tests, they do want students to understand modern IQ testing and how it's important. This slide highlights the evolution of IQ testing, specifically with the Stanford Binet. I will highlight one more on the next slide. 
The most commonly used IQ test today is the WACE, or the Weichler Adult Intelligence Scale, specifically the latest version, the WACE 4, which assesses the intellectual capabilities of adults and older adolescents. The WISC, or the Weichler Intelligence Scale for Children, is primarily used for younger test takers. Both tests evaluate various cognitive abilities and are frequently used in educational, clinical, and research settings. The WACE 4 measures cognitive functioning through four key scores, verbal comprehension, perceptual reasoning, working memory, and processing speed, with each area including subtests for specific skills like vocabulary and problem solving. Modern IQ tests primarily help identify individuals' cognitive abilities for educational and psychological support, as well as diagnosing learning disabilities, assessing intellectual disabilities, or identifying giftedness, and creating personalized education plans. In adults, these tests can also identify cognitive changes, such as early signs of decline or brain injury. Modern IQ tests still use the score of 100 to represent the average intelligence for a given age, but the original formula MA divided by CA times 100 is no longer used because it had limitations and that it only really worked for children. Consider this, as you're aging, especially into adulthood, you might consider the fact that we are not incrementally increasing our cognitive abilities um, incrementally like we are our years and our age. For example, you might have the mental abilities of a 40-year-old at age 40 and still maintain those same mental abilities at age 60. A 60-year-old with the mental abilities of a 40-year-old is really great. So this formula just doesn't quite make sense as people enter adulthood. So that old formula that compared mental age to actual age became problematic with adults. So if we take that example of a 40-year-old with 40-year-old mental abilities, you would do 40 divided by 40 times 100, which would equal the average IQ for a 40-year-old. But suppose that 40-year-old maintained those same mental abilities of a 40-year-old when they became 60. You would do 40 divided by 60 times 100, and that would equal an IQ of 67. So even though a 60-year-old with the mental abilities of a 40-year-old sounds really great, the IQ score would come out as a score of 67, and that would appear that they've had some mental decline. So modern IQ tests actually compare an individual's score to the average score of people in their age group. So a 60-year-old would still have an IQ of 100 if their performance matched that of other 60-year-olds. And this was to ensure the fairness and just preventing IQ from appearing to drop with age. While intelligence tests have contributed to psychology, they've also had a history of misuse, often restricting access and opportunities to certain groups of people. In the 1800s, Francis Galton, an English scientist and cousin of Charles Darwin, sought to prove that intelligence was inherited. He tested over 10,000 individuals, supporting the eugenics movement by advocating that only people with desirable traits like higher intelligence should reproduce, while discouraging the reproduction of those he deemed less intelligent. Misuse continued with U.S. psychologist Robert Yerkes, who during World War I developed the Army Alpha and Army Beta tests for 1.7 million soldiers. The Army Alpha was for English speakers, while the Army Beta was for those who either couldn't read or speak English. These tests determined military leadership selection, favoring those from upper class Anglo-American backgrounds due to the culturally specific content of the questions. Those with lower scores, often from different cultural or socioeconomic backgrounds, were excluded from leadership roles. In the 1920s, after the Immigration Act of 1924, the Army Beta Test was used on immigrants at Ellis Island to assess their eligibility for entry. Immigrants unfamiliar with culturally biased items like light bulbs or phonographs or unfamiliar with tasks like filling in bubbles were often labeled as unfit for entry, just reinforcing discriminatory views on intelligence. These examples highlight the potential of harm of intelligence testing when applied unethically or without consideration of cultural biases. The Army Alpha and the Army Beta tests failed to account for cultural biases, meaning that they measured the societal knowledge rather than true intelligence. Today, researchers aim to create intelligence assessments that are socio 
culturally responsive, considering different cultural backgrounds and reducing bias in test results. Two key concepts related to this are stereotype threat and stereotype lift. Stereotype threat occurs when individuals from a negatively stereotyped group perform worse on a test after being reminded of the stereotype. For example, if women are reminded of the stereotype that men are better at math, their test performance may suffer compared to women who are not reminded of this. Stereotype lift happens when individuals from a positively stereotyped group perform better after being reminded of their group's advantage. For example, men reminded of their stereotyped math superiority might perform better. To minimize stereotype threat and stereotype lift, researchers focus on language choices and tests. For instance, consistently using male names in math problems may unintentionally increase anxiety in women while boosting men's confidence. And reducing culturally specific content in tests and using diverse names and examples might mitigate these biases. By addressing these issues, researchers work to make intelligence tests more inclusive and fair. On the screen are the results of two studies demonstrating stereotype threat. In a pivotal 1995 study, Claude Steele and Joshua Aronson investigated the effects of stereotype threat on African-American college students' performances in standardized tests. The study included both African-American and white students. They randomly assigned the participants to two groups. One group was told the tests they were about to take measured their intellectual ability. This activated the stereotype threat while the other group was told they would be completing a problem-solving exercise, and this minimized that threat. The results showed that the African-American students who believed they were being assessed on their intelligence actually performed significantly worse than the African-American students who were told they were just going to complete a problem-solving task, whereas the white students' performance remained consistent across both conditions. The results on the right show a study from 1999 that examined the stereotype threat that affects women's performance in math. In this study, both male and female students were divided into two groups. Only one group was informed that they were going to take a test that measured their math abilities, likely activating the stereotype threat for this group. The results showed that women performed significantly worse on the test when they believed the test they were taking was evaluating their math skills, while the men's performance remained unchanged. These two studies further highlight the pressure of negative stereotypes and how they can hinder performance of individuals from stereotyped groups, emphasizing the importance of creating supportive educational environments to help reach all students and their potential. In this discussion about intelligence testing, it's important to note that there are a variety of factors that can influence the results of intelligence tests other than intelligence itself. Factors like poverty and educational inequities can also play a role in student scores. For example, research has shown that children growing up in poverty often face significant challenges, such as inadequate access to quality education, nutrition, and stable home environments. These factors can negatively influence cognitive development and consequently IQ scores. So a child from a low-income background might score lower on IQ tests than a peer from a more affluent background, not necessarily due to differences in intelligence but because of the resources and opportunities available to them. As you can see in the scatter plot on the screen, this particular sample represents a negative correlation between child poverty rates and the share of fourth grade readers at proficient levels. So as poverty rate increases, the share of students reading at proficiency levels declines. Finally, let's talk about something researchers call the Flynn effect. The Flynn effect was noted in the 1980s when researchers analyzed data from various IQ tests and found that scores had increased in many countries over successive generations, typically increasing about three points per decade since the early 20th century. Several factors have been proposed to explain the Flynn effect, including improved education, access to better nutrition, exposure to more complex environments with new technology and media, allowing for new problem solving and video gaming and complex complex puzzles, and even advanced extracurricular activities. But overall, the Flynn effect highlights the dynamic nature of intelligence and the various impact of environmental and social factors that can influence how we do on cognitive assessments across generations. All right, let's finish with some review. Question number one says, Marcus solves reasoning problems quickly. What form of intelligence is he most strongly demonstrating? 
Question number two says, Gabrielle has a high capacity to learn, think, and adapt, allowing her to function effectively in her environment. What concept is illustrated here? And last, to accurately define the Flynn effect, which of the following should Declan say in his presentation? This brings us to the end of today's video. Make sure that you understand our key vocabulary terms and can answer our essential questions.